we're wow. going to talk about uh, questions that are thundering. <laughs> thundering questions. What's happening in 770 Chabad World Headquarters? The story broke on Monday night when my son called me from Chicago. He was supposed to go to New York for a special trip to the OHEL, to 770. And he told me, but we can't go because of what's happening in, in 770. I said, what's happening in 770? And he filled me in with all the drama. And I'm like, oh, boy. Oh, boy. So I um, hope nobody hears about this. <laughs> Next thing I know, it hit the newspaper, New York Post yesterday. And uh, it was uh, it was quite confusing. I saw it in Drudge Report, you know. If, okay, let me tell you what happened. So, so the story goes like this, that... In brief, what happened was yesterday, uh, was maybe Monday, Monday must have happened, today's Wednesday. What must have happened was that um, there was a tunnel underneath 770, the shul, the Rebbe's shul. Somebody had been digging a tunnel <laughs> in today's climate. That's uh, very <laughs> serious the stuff. Was Hamas. I saw the tunnel. They, they were digging a tunnel and mm -hmm. the tunnel went to the mikvah, to an unused mikvah. And when the police heard about it, well, apparently neighbors heard the digging under the ground. <laughs> In today's climate, that's a little uh, concerning, to say the least, right? So the police were called. They showed up with a cement truck. And when they tried to pump cement into the tunnel, the some of the students of the yeshiva went crazy. They started throwing benches towards the police. I believe, I think that they even, you know, pepper sprayed them. They try to pepper spray them. And I have to commend the NYPD for having exercised such sensitivity, restraint. you know, restraint. They really, I think they understood that they're dealing with some mentally deranged individuals. And they must have understood that because they really were very professional about the, the way they were handling it. And they um, arrested some of them. They shut down 770. And they must be filling up the cement by now in the tunnel. And that was pretty much the story. Now, there were some videos. Up, but they destroyed. Oh, now, so what happened? When they were there, when they were there, the students, some of these some of these yeshiva students, ripped down a wall. They tore down a wall. I, I wasn't sure why they tore down the wall, if they were exposing the tunnel or not exposing the tunnel. I, I, it seemed to me like they were like, I'm not even sure why they were doing that. Honestly, I don't know. What wall? And then there, there was a wall in 770. In, in, in the shul. Inside of 770. There's a wall. There's a wall. So they like tore down like the wooden. Which were the wooden, the wooden section is. It was underneath the women's section. Right underneath the wooden. And it, it caused that to collapse. No, nothing collapsed. Nothing collapsed. They just tore They tore down the wooden paneling and exposed this massive opening, which seems to be the opening of a tunnel, towards the mikvahs. Now, what's the story? What's going on over here, right? It seems like they also tried to block this the cement truck. They tried to... They tried to stand in the way of the cement truck and maybe go into the tunnels that they couldn't pump the, 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 the you know. And now you're starting to get into human shields. <laughs> like, like maybe they're putting people in there in order to prevent, um, you know, prevent, um, you know, the cops from coming in. So it just sounded like such a crazy story that it went viral. The story went viral in today's climate, obviously. I heard even the Hamas uh, posted some video of, uh, you know, with it. And there was all these little tweet and, and, and the worst part the worst part is that some anti-semites uh, uh yeah. fed on the story and the, those stories went viral you know bad news spreads much 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 faster than good news so so there were like these tweets that were tweet retweeted many 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 times on social media about the jews building tunnels under a synagogue in new york as if to say they're also doing it yeah. right oh people only read headlines and don't read the story anyways so obviously our phones were blowing up yesterday about what's going on Immediately to his credit, uh, Hannah's grandfather, Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky, the chairman of Chabad World Headquarters, issued a statement, which I'd like to read to you, just so that it should be clear to anybody watching this that they should know what's going on. Um, the statement reads as follows. Um, uh, just bear with me a moment. Here. The statement reads as follows. It's signed by Rabbi Yehuda Krinsky. Statement by Chabad, by Chabad Lubavitch headquarters. The Chabad Lubavitch community is pained by the vandalism of a group of young agitators who damaged the synagogue below Chabad headquarters at 770 Eastern Parkway Monday night. These 
odious actions will be investigated and the sanctity of the synagogue will be restored. Uh, thanks to the NYPD for their professionalism and sensitivity. We are great, grateful for the outpouring of concern and for the support of our Chabad Lubavitch institutions around the world. Now, uh, what, what, what's going on over here is like this, is that um, you have a, a bunch of students that are mentally deranged. What they did was, apparently this tunnel began during COVID. When New York was shut down, the synagogues was shut down. And what they did was, is that they surreptitiously dug this tunnel underneath uh, the, the between the mikveh and the synagogues that they could get into the synagogue when it was probably in a state of lockdown in order that they could get into the holiness of the shul with the Rebbe David. Because these guys clearly didn't care too much about... Uh, about um, pandemics and other such trivialities. So they felt that they needed to go there and they probably were sneaking their way in and feeling very uh, holy and uplifted in, uh, you know, praying like that. So they went from this unused mikvah, which is a men's, a men's mikvah. Yeah, like an unused. Uh, it's not a woman's mikvah, it's a men's mikvah. I was there many years ago and it was in a state of, it was uh, the building was shut down like 20 something years ago. No, it was a men's mikvah. Oh, sounds like a woman's mikvah, which sounds uh, already more. Sounded like they reported it. As which a so it sounds like there's some the sort of uh, person, of uh, unbecoming one behavior. One more, one more terrible. Right. Any, anything it's anything not a woman's mikvah. It's a men's like mikvah. What? Anything to make Chabad look like a bunch of posted right. men's mikvah. Okay, fine. Different stories. You know, one thing you, you know, one thing we learned is that in case you ever thought that the, that the news was accurate. You know, when the story is about you or your community or something which you're intimately familiar with, it's very interesting. You know, the comments coming in within the Chabad community was like, you know, the story is so distorted that it co forces you to rethink everything you hear about any other story yeah. that you you hear. Like, you, you know, like I like to say, if you if you've read if you're not read the news, you're uninformed. But if you have read the news, you're misinformed, right? And and this is a classic example. Now we know that the media is not not a friend of the Jews, and even though the media is typically um, run by Jewish, uh, you know, by, by Jewish uh, editors and so on. Yeah, yeah. They're they're the uh, they're the Jewish anti-Semites, and uh, it's very tragic when people try to throw their own people under the bus. Um, what happened was that these guys tried to they dug this tunnel, and apparently it was okay for a couple of years because nobody knew about it. And um, they then they then. Um, Oh, what happened now? They must have been trying to expand the tunnel, and that's why there was there was these noises. They must have been trying to expand the tunnel, and that's why the neighbors heard these noises, and they called the police, and that's what happened. So, at the end of the day, bottom line story is that you're dealing with a complete fanatical fringe. It's absolutely crazy. It's 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 a small, tiny group. Every society has its mishugayim, right? It's like the David Ben Gurion said. Well, no, we have our own country when we have our own. Homegrown Jewish Ganovim, our own Jewish thieves. <laughs> That's when we know we've established our own country. You gotta have that fringe of the of the society. Every single society has a bunch of Meshuganas. Like just it's an, these were students. Yeah. Were, They're Israeli students. students, actually. They come yeah, from Israel. They were on a now they visa. would have been on student visas, right, yeah. which could have easily been revoked if not that uh, the United States uh, gave Israel uh, the visa waiver program now. But I'm sure that they they're gonna be able to to you know, but do they, something, send them back home. Are you throwing stuff at the police? Like, seriously? It's not, uh, you know, it's not how we behave. You know, I, I think the police, after the way they did, with such restraint, in large part, out of respect for Kabbalah, I mean, obviously, they, the police, the aldermen, are, are very familiar with Kabbalah. And yeah, the 71st precinct over there is very familiar with the Jewish yeah, community. Right, so they, they, they work very closely they together. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I have to say it's been it's been challenging since the Rebbe passed away. It has been challenging for the past 30 years yeah. since the Rebbe passed away where what happened was there was this um, schism mm -hmm. within the Chabad community. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's where, where the, there was this this group that came out of uh, primarily out of the north of Israel, out of the Tzfat, the north of Israel, where they they have this approach of um, proclaiming the Rebbe as the Mashiach, right, I that. and um, 
and, and doing so without any regard of how it, the message is being received. Um, and they already took over 770 in a way that is a little difficult for us, shluchim, people like myself. You know, there are emissaries out there in the field to really want to bring people to 770. Did I bring you there? I didn't even bring you there. Yeah, I didn't take you to 770 because it's, it's, it's painful. It's hard to bring you to the Rebbe's show. I'll take you to the Ohel, to the Rebbe's resting place. I'll take you to the Rebbe's room upstairs. I'll take you to my grandfather's office, the Chabad World Headquarters. I'll take you to the Kinnas, to the convention of the Shluchim. But to go inside a 770 is not so simple because it's, it's, it's become a situation where the inmates are running the asylum. And they're they're aggressive. It's 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 a little bit like it's a situation where you have um, people that are, you know, um, behavior that's fueled by irrational irrational faith and passion that is very difficult to to curtail. Mm -hmm. So they're like the Rebbe is the Mashiach, and we have to shot that down from the hilltops and. And down your throat, and we have to tell, to recite it every 15 seconds, and and every sign and every street post. And in Israel, they'll put stickers everywhere, you know, which to me is a desecration of the Rebbe's face. I mean, the Rebbe's on every street sign. It's embarrassing. So what you're saying is there are people that are running from God now that are saying he was the Mashiach. Wasn't? Was. Is, was. No, they're not running anything. They're not running anything. No, no, there is, there is. No, let's talk about. Let's talk about the running of the Chabad. Let's talk about that for a moment. So there's, there's two. There's two. Um, so, so the Chabad is really a decentralized. Um, I'm going to call it a franchise, where every Chabad center is given its own little territory. Where the Chabad of Palm Beach Gardens, and there's a Chabad of this and a Chabad of that. You know, where the Rebbe really, in a very beautiful way, he, like Moses, in the parsha in a few weeks' time, who. We realized that the work was too much for him. So what he did was is that he shared his spirit with 70 elders. Yeah. And in much the same way, like no Jewish history, like, like no Jewish leader in history, the Rebbe did that. So by the time the Rebbe left the world in 1994, he had an army of 12,000 men and women that were his soldiers, that were generals in their locations and growing. Right, places like you know uh, San Diego, San Francisco, South America, South Africa, everywhere. There's you know there's just the Rebbe's people everywhere, and those people are the Rebbe's of their community, so to speak. The Rabbi, the Rebbe's, and with the Shluchim, were the the emissaries of the Rebbe. So we bring in the Rebbe to the community, right? You tell the Shaliach that look at what you built. You should be so proud of yourself. The Shaliach will look at you in a, in a second. You'll say, "This is not me. It's the Rebbe's blessings that are shining through me." My role is to be transparent to the Rebbe's blessings. So in that way, we try to allow the Rebbe's light to shine through us. So that's how Chabad is decentralized in all these places, right? When Rabbi Chaim Miller was here, he was the author of the, the Gutnik Chumash, the brown Chumash, and the other one, the blue and white Chumash. He's done many, many books, he wrote the practical Tanya that we use, whatever. Um, when he spoke here a few years ago, somebody asked him a question. So who's the new Rebbe of Chabad? Who took over the Rebbe? So Rabbi Miller answered a very, very beautiful answer. He said the new Rebbe is the Shluchim. That the Rebbe empowered, he carried his spirit over to the Shluchim so that he lives on through their bodies. Right? Just like it says in the Talmud that Jacob didn't die. It says that in the Talmud, Tainus, tracted Tainus. It says Jacob didn't die. The Talmud asks, what do you mean he didn't die? And the, the Torah says they, they eulogized him, they, they embalmed him, they buried him, there's a funeral. What do you mean he didn't die? Mazari Bachaim Afu Bachaim says the Talmud. If his children are alive, then he's alive. If his children are carrying on his legacy, we're fighting the Rebbe's message. We're bringing the, world, the, the Rebbe's message to the world. <laughs> then he's alive. He's living on through us, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's some sensitive topics I want to touch on over here. So, so bear with me. So that's where Chabad is around the world, out in the field. But what about headquarters? In headquarters, it's complicated because there's the shul over there. And it's, it's run by these yeshiva students that are aggressive. They're aggressive and they're, they, they don't. You know, there's their worldview, and they don't tolerate any other worldview. Isn't there an interview process? That's how you get a, a one leader. Supposedly there is, but that's that's where the weakness is, is that the, the people in charge of that show, they just kind of let anybody in. Mm -hmm. And the guys that come in there, they become aggressive, and they become, like, they, they won't allow somebody who, does, who, who doesn't espouse the view that the Rebbe is the Mashiach. They won't allow him to have an aliyah in the shul or to, to come into the shul and pray, pray in peace. They'll harass them. Oh. There's harassment going on. How did they, become, how did they gain control or become in charge of the shul? Um, 
I hate to use the word terrorism, but through terror tactics, they would like just yeah. intimidation. It's like that whenever one, a king passes and he doesn't pass it on a void. another one. You have Yehuda by Israel. It's a void. He split the so I hate to use that word, but 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 there was that that sense of intimidation, right? And they would like intimidate their the, the, their their uh, those that weren't aligned with their political or, or world spiritual views. And you know, when when you have faith that's irrational, you can't reason with them, and and, and they're being they're being indoctrinated. Now, they're not aggressive in the sense that they're dangerous. They're not dangerous, but they will exhibit, make behavior which is unpleasant, aggressive. right? Aggressive, right? So that's what happened. They kind of took it over. And this has been festering for 30 years now since the Rebbe passed away, right? Now, let's talk about the Rebbe being Mashiach for a moment, right? So Mashiach, okay? Mashiach is a big, big role to fill. The Messiah. We've been waiting for this Messiah for mm -hmm. 3,000 some years. Moses at the burning bush was like, listen, God, why are you sending me? Send send the Messiah. So he said, Shlach send the one that's going to bring him into the land. Why, why are you sending me? Let it be one and done, right? Can there ever be Mashiach? Let's just talk about this for a few moments, right? What do you think? Is he a descendant of the line of David? Yes. No. Why no? No. Because there are prophecies. Uh, is the question was: Is he a descendant of the line of David? That was the question. Did he walk into? Did he come into Jerusalem on a donkey? Okay, that's not the question that he asked. The question. The question. No, no, about donkeys. The you're asking. A, you answer a different question. Yeah, Hang on. What? What? One, one step at a time. Your first question wasn't. I'm talking. I thought you were answering this question. Mashiach needs to be a descendant of the line of David. In fact, in fact, let me get a book of you. Jesus uh, was the descendant of the line of David. He was? Yeah, so. A gazillion people were descendants of the line of David. So, so you um, might even be. Yeah, what happened? Uh, 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 um, sure. I want to ask you a favor, um, Andy. Don't get emotional about the question right now. Seriously. Don't get emotional. I'm serious. We're having an intellectual conversation. So, so you're going to tell me, well, you're throwing Jesus over here. You know what I mean? You gotta, let's not get. Let's not. Let's not no, I'm, no, 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 Andy. Seriously, Andy. Really, I'm asking you, please. Let's keep this an intellectual conversation. And we're, I, I, I asked you a tough question, but if you're going to give me an emotional answer, you're going you're gonna to throw me, throw us all off. You know, that's no, not the direction we're going in. Your question, you got another question. So, well, I asked you. You got two questions. So he asked a question. The question is, what's the question again? There's the question I asked is, is the question I ask is, what is, well, can, can the Rebbe be Mashiach? That was the question right. I asked, right? Right, right? Now we're going to keep it intellectual, and right? We're having an intellectual conversation, right? Exactly. Because if you want to get emotional, then forget about it. You don't need me for this. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay, good. Yeah. So the answer is, so the first, the answer was Marty's question. Marty asked, well, is he from the line of David? Which means that Marty is aware that Maimonides gives us a list of what it takes to qualify as the Mashiach. Let's take a look at that list. And that explains what I should say. What is, what are the what, what is the, the list, criteria? right? What the What's the criteria? So I just pulled it up. I just pulled it up. Here it is. What's Here it is. What's the job description? Okay, so, so <laughs> the job description appears in Maimonides' Laws of Kings, okay? This is the very, very end of Maimonides' 14 books. The 14 books of Maimonides. Uh, the Laws of Kings, okay? Um, it goes like this. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Very fundamental, very important. The Messianic king will rise in the future and restore the divinic king kingdom to its former state and original sovereignty. He will build a sanctuary and gather the dispersed of Israel. All the laws will be reinstituted in his days as they had been aforetime. Sacrifices will be offered and the sabbatical years and jubilee years will be observed fully as ordained by the Torah. Anyone who does not believe in, in Mashiach or whoever does not look forward to his coming denies not only the teachings of the other prophets but also of the Torah and of Moses, our teacher. For the Torah tested him as it is said. Now he brings a whole bunch of prophecies which I'm going to skip. These words explicitly said in the Torah include all the messianic statements made by the prophets. I'm skipping from the. Uh, I'm skipping over the, uh, the the Torah sources that Maimonides brings that there is a Mashiach. Do not think that the messianic king will have to perform signs and wonders and bring about novel things in the world, or resurrect the dead and other such things. It is not so, says Maimonides. Yeah. This is, I'm just reading straight from Maimonides, right? This is seen from the fact that Rabbi Akiva was a great sage of the sages of the Mishnah, and he was the armor bearer of King Bar Koziba. And said of him, Rabbi Akiva said of Bar Koziba that he was the Messianic king. Rabbi Akiva and all the wise men of his generation considered him to be the Messianic king until 
Bar Koziba was killed because of his sins. And when he was killed, they realized that he was not. But the sages had not asked him for any sign or wonder. The essence of all this is that is that this Torah of ours is statutes and laws are forever. Uh, okay, now here it is. Here's the qualifications list. Here it is. If a king arises from the house of David, right. son after son, the house of David, mm -hmm. who meditates on the Torah and occupies himself with the commandments, like his ancestor David, in accordance with the written and oral Torah. And he will prevail upon all of Israel to walk in the ways of the Torah and strengthen its breaches. And he will fight the battles of God. It may be assumed that he is the Mashiach. That's, it. That's all that it says here. That's all. It doesn't say that he resurrected the dead. It doesn't say that he uh, gathered the exiles or the other stuff that we said before. It, said, it doesn't say that he has to do a single miracle. He has to be summarized. He has to be a descendant of David, son after son. He has to meditate on Torah and occupy himself with the commandments like his ancestor David. That's a lot. Number three, he's got to prevail upon, he's got to influence all of Israel in the ways of Torah and strengthen its breaches, and he's got to fight the battles of God. That's it. Now, you mention Jesus. Was Jesus son after son from, from David? Yes or no? no? Yes or no? I don't know. I don't know. I, don't uh, know. I do know. Was Joseph? Uh, I do know. Do you know who his father was? Joseph. Yeah. No. Yes. Who do they say his father was? God. Oh. God. Okay, so he's not from the line of David. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Joseph? serious. Was Joseph? Guys, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not. It's not. Guys, you need to understand. It's not a Baba Mitzvah. No, no. This is not a Baba. You need to understand. That wasn't the point. If somebody in the Middle Ages, when they had this debate with the Christians. And the Christian would say, why don't you Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah? But they couldn't say that. So that, that would have been uh, treasonous and, and ended in execution. They, they couldn't even say that he was, well, according to you guys, he's the son of God. I mean, they might have been able to say this. If he's the son of God, that's fantastic. But it doesn't qualify to be the son of David, right? He's got to be the line of David, which is why it's important, Andy, without getting emotional, to understand why he was disqualified. Approach, Who took to, a matrilineal approach? I'm not here to justify that. That's not the point. Since when do we take a matrilineal approach when it comes to tribal tribal affiliation? Yeah, that's the question, but besides that, it says that he has to observe all the Torah mitzvahs. Did, did Jesus do that? Uh, I don't think he, he did that. He changed a lot of the laws. He was a rabbi. But he was a renegade rabbi. He, a, he broke the laws. He wasn't. He didn't no, fulfill he made, even I mean, one of these laws. That's, that's the so only thing going for him was that he was a good speaker. <laughs> what? so-called laws were published post-mortem by those who established Which laws? new religion. Maimonides? Oh, you're talking about no, Christianity. Just forget Christianity. Fine. No, it's very good. Let's go back. Let's go back to, to the case over here. So yeah. so let's we're talking about the Rebbe. We have, we asked the question about 770, right? Yeah. So does the Rebbe yeah. come like de descendant of King David? The answer is a hundred percent yes. The, the, the Rebbe is a son after son from the Tzemach Tzedek the third Chabad Rebbe, who's a son after son from the Alter Rebbe, who is a seventh generation son after son from the Maral of Prague, who is a direct descendant son after son of King David. This is a documented fact. I published it in my own family tree. If you want to find it, it's at jewishgardens.com forward slash roots. Now that's my family tree. I'm a sixth cousin from the Rebbe. But if you look at the family tree, you'll see from King David all the way down to the Maral of Prague so, and the Alter so Rebbe was son so after you, son. So are you King David? I am not from, uh, well... Uh, I'll tell you because in my family tree, I go young? through the the the, the Alter Rebbe, the the Mitzel Rebbe, the second. Then the Mitzel Rebbe's daughter was uh, Menucha Rachel. So, uh, could it be that her her husband was from David? I don't know. I'm not sure, but I know that my line I do come from David. But there was mothers of them. Maybe I'm not. I don't know either. I'm not. I'm not. Right. But let's look at the Rebbe from a purely intellectual approach. The Rebbe's son of the son from King David. Check. Does the Rebbe occupy himself in Torah and mitzvahs like David, his ancestor? If, so. It seems so, yeah. I, I mean, there's nobody else. You open one book of the Rebbe's of the Rebbe's teachings, one, one, any page. Open any page, and you just look at the footnotes. Don't even read it. Just look at the footnotes and the the cross referencing through all of Torah. There is no no sage today that has that kind of breadth and depth in Torah. It's unbelievable. The Rebbe published had of his works published, and they're still being published because they can't keep up with it. The Rebbe probably had 400, 500 volumes of, of Torah teachings that, that have already been published, and they're still working on editing them and expanding them. So, so that's, there's no, no secret here. Yeah. Now, the third one is very interesting. 
He will prevail upon all of Israel to walk in the ways of Torah and strengthen its breaches. No, no, no. Prevail upon all of Israel, the people of Israel. He'll influence all of the Jews in the world to grow in Torah mitzvahs. Now, that's a very interesting one. When you think about, you know, how many, how many great rabbis, descended of King David, great scholars, have actually been able to influence more than their immediate community. Because, you know, you've got big rabbis in Lakewood and in, and in Gateshead in England and in London and in Borough Park and in Jerusalem. And B'nai B'nai. Great rabbis. But with, beyond their own communities, they're not very well-known. And maybe if they are well-known in the, in the Orthodox Jewish community, nobody ever heard of them in the conservative or the reform or the unaffiliated Jewish community. You look at the Rebbe and you're like, you know that 40% of American Jews have a relationship with Chabad. That's like, whoa. That's crazy. That's crazy. When religion is, is on the decline across all sectors, and you look at that, you're like, whoa, that's that's eyebrow raising, right? Mm -hmm. And the final one, you will fight the battles of God. That's a bit of a, a difficult one because it's, yeah. it's hard to, to identify. But was the Rebbe, you know, 1967, Six Day War, he was, where, you know, we're going to win this war, we're going to late fill in, and, and all those campaigns. It's interesting. There's a lot of interesting things here. So back to my original question. Now that we see the definition of Mashiach, right? Mashiach is not a popularity contest. Could the Rebbe be Mashiach? That's the question. The answer is? Possibly. Possibly. He checks in all boxes. Now, big argument here is, well, he died. But he died. But he died. Now, that's a very, very interesting position. Why? We read before in the Rambam that Bar Koziba, they thought he was Mashiach, and Rabbi Kiva, of all people. But he was killed. The key here was killed. He was killed for his sins. He was killed for his sins. He was actually very arrogant. He was very arrogant, and he decided that he didn't need to follow Hashem, didn't need to listen to the sages, and he did something very, very bad, and that's why he was killed for his sins. Killed and died is different. There's a misconception amongst the Jewish community that if Mashiach dies, if the person dies, he can't be Mashiach. Why? Because in the Middle Ages, and this, by the way, comes from Rabbi, Rabbi Yohanan Abishitz, who's the uh, Yaris Vash, the, the book, his name of his book is... Um, is uh, the forest of honey, and he uh, he he was often debating with uh, Christians in the Middle Ages. Very great rabbi in the Middle Ages in Prussia. So he, he writes in his book, you know, that the mis that that the belief that Mashiach, who that a person who dies can't be Mashiach, is a huge misconception. We only, I'm going to quote his words exactly now. We only said that to the Christians in order to in order to push them off with straw. We said that because they would ask us, why can't Jesus be the Messiah? And we would say, because he died. And they were like, oh. But that's not a real argument because the Talmud says explicitly in Tractate Sanhedrin 98a, what does the Talmud say? It says, who is Mashiach? And the Talmud answers, if he's from the living, then it's Rabbi Yehuda the Prince. But if he's from the dead, it's probably someone like Daniel of the lion's den. That's what the Talmud says. The Talmud says that straight up. Dead, so, so the Talmud says straight up, he could be from the living, he could be from the dead, right? He could be resurrected from the dead. The Talmud says that straight up in Sanhedrin 98. The whole idea that Mashiach who dies can't, is no longer qualified came from a thousand years or more of fighting the Christians in, in, in these tribunals in front of the kings. And you were not allowed to win the debate. I've spoken about this before. Because if you win the debate, that's treason. You're making fun of Christianity. But if you lose the debate, you've got to convert to Christianity. So they had to walk this very fine line. I, I don't envy them. Um, but back to our question. A, a, a candidate for the Mashiach who dies doesn't mean that he's no longer the Mashiach, right? And therefore, I want to say this in closing. The miracles of Mashiach. I want to say this. If you ask me, if you ask me who's a candidate to be Mashiach today, it's very hard to find the candidate today for the Mashiach. It's very, very hard. No, there has to be a Mashiach. There has to be a person every generation that he knows that uh, that, that is the that is the sleeper cell. This is from the commentaries of Torah. Sleeper cell that he's ready for Hashem to appoint him to notify him. However, when I think of who could be the Mashiach today, who, who who's going to be the Mashiach? Some author, some uh, TV personality, some uh, some radio show host in Israel. Bibi Netanyahu, Donald Trump, who do you think is from this the Mashiach? You know, who, who? Seriously, who do you think, right? When you look intellectually at these things, personally, I think, you know, I would be shocked if it wasn't the Rebbe. I'd be shocked because I, I don't know anybody that comes close to the Rebbe. Well, 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 it's not, why, why isn't, 
again, if it's from the living, if it's from the dead. Yeah. But Honestly, but Rob, I don't care. I don't care who it is. Let him come already. That's what I care about. Yeah, but okay, but uh, that's the confusion. So I uh, assume he is the Mashiach. But when the Mashiach comes, certain things happen. That's what I so, right, yeah, exactly. Right. So what do you mean certain things happen? Certain things happen. Like, like what? what, what do you, be, spe be specific, please. That's incorrect. What do you mean certain things that Can you be specific? No, no. Wrong. That's incorrect. Gan Eden. We don't go to Gan Eden. Gan Eden is a waiting room for the souls of the deceased to wait for the resurrection. But... But but you, we have to learn about this, and, and I'm sorry for uh, for being a little frustrated. I'm sorry if I yeah, whatever. Let me let me just explain. Certain things need to happen. It's not correct. Maimonides said so explicitly. Not a single miracle needs to happen in order for Mashiach to 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 be declared the Mashiach. But by the way, the, he does continue, and I want to share with you. I want to share with you what, what Maimonides continues to explain to your point. Okay. Here, look. One is the the but Maimonides is the great codifier of all of Jewish history. He's the first of three upon which the code of Jewish law is founded. I mean, he's like the ultimate legal ruling of all of Jewish history. Maimonides was known as the Mishnah Torah, the second to Torah. Everybody, and, and, and in fact, on his tomb, and everybody knows from Moses until Moses, Maimonides, there was none like Moses. That's what it says. Moshe, Moshe, Moshe. There's nobody, Jen, that, that doesn't accept Maimonides. In his days, though, his books were burnt. Very interesting. There was there was a lot of opposition. Next chapter, you got to hear this. This is now the final chapter in the entire Manus Opus of Maimonides. One is not to presume that anything of the ways of the world will be set aside in the Messianic era. It won't be. One is not to presume that anything of the ways of the world will be set aside in the Messianic era, or that there will be any innovation in the order of creation. Rather. The world will continue according to its norms. As for that which is said in Isaiah, that the wolf will dwell with the sheep and the leopard will lie with the kid. That sounds miraculous, right? right. Yeah. Peace. This is an allegory and a metaphor. Peace, it means that Israel shall dwell securely alongside the wicked heathens who are likened to wolves and leopards. As it is said, a wolf that from the plain ravages, a leopard lies on the weight in the cities. In the Messianic era, all will return to the true religion and will neither steal nor destroy, but consume that which is permitted in repose alongside Israel. As it is written, said, the lion will eat straw like the ox. All other such expressions are also allegories. And in the Messianic era, sorry, in the era of the Messianic king, everyone will come to know what the allegory is about and what illusions are indicated. So in other words, we're not clear, but we know that no, nothing has to happen. The sages said, next, next paragraph, there is no difference between the present age and the Messianic era but the delivery from subjection to foreign powers. That's what it says. The only difference between now and the era of Mashiach is the fall of empires, monarchies, right? Shibud Malchi is, right? right? You told me so I could have a cheeseburger when the Mashiach comes. And I, thought I, could I didn't say that. Oh, no, no, hang on, hang on. So now, now there's a second right. stage. Now, this is very it's interesting. Food? This is very so, Rob, Rob, there is a second stage. There is a second stage. Wow. The second stage is because you're asking, I can see your frustration. That, that you're like, Rabbi, what about the resurrection of the dead? That sounds miraculous to me. Was, was, yeah, was, like, come on, Rabbi, you're missing the, 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 big, the big stuff over here, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, so the answer to that is the answer to that is like this. The answer to the, like is, is like this. There's two stages of, of, of Mashiach. There's your Moisa Mashiach, the days of Mashiach, the Messianic era. And then there's Olam Abba, which is the world to come. Not Gan Eden, which you mentioned before. Gan Eden is a spiritual place. It's the heavenly reward for your hard work in this world. But it's a waiting room. Souls are waiting there for 3,000 years. What for? What are they waiting for to come down when Mashiach comes? When Mashiach comes, the Messianic era is what we've just described, where the world rises to higher consciousness. I believe, and the Rebbe said this, we are already in the Messianic era because the world is rising to divine awareness. You know, but whether it's scientific, technological, disease eradication, in many, many fronts, we are working towards consciousness. People today are conscious. What? We're, we're doing a lot better than 150 years ago, right? You have to admit to that, right? Now, after the Messianic era, 
It's not exactly clear when that ends. There reaches a point where the whole world is now aware of Hashem. Now there's the resurrection of the dead. Then is the rebuilding of our temple in Jerusalem. Then is the ingathering of the exiles and all the miracles that you've heard. That happens later. That's when we, we see the transformation of the, young, of the sadness days into yuntas. All the yuntas will be canceled except for Purim. It says, it says that the books of the Torah will no longer be used except for the Megillah of Esther. That's like a whole different experience where the dead will come rising again. But that's a second stage. So back to the Meshuggahners. Meshuggahners, right. right. So Meshuggahners. That's right. You have, to, you have to be able to understand where they're coming from. And that's why I went into this deep dive of this conversation. Because, you know, they're screaming in the rivers of Meshuggah. That's a crazy thing. It's not such a crazy thing. You know, if you look in Jewish history... The, the, the amount of people that qualify this incredibly difficult list of Maimonides to qualify for, a scion of David, son of the son, a, a, assiduous scholar, uh, uh, a, a exceptional in observance of mitzvahs, which disqualifies any renegade rabbis. Any rabbi that decides, oops, a Shabbos is canceled, uh, actually you don't need to keep kosher anymore, that they're all disqualified, no matter how great a speaker they are, right? And then influencing world jury, how many people how many rabbis, how many sages in Jewish history have been able to say that they've influenced world jury? Like Maimonides probably is, is a, an amazing candidate for that. The Arizal is an amazing candidate for that. Probably the Baal Shem Tov is an amazing candidate for that. But you probably have three or four dozen individuals in history that have done that. Abraham, right? So the rabbis is a very, very, very strong candidate. Now, the rabbi, by the way, often spoke. He never spoke about himself. It was always his father-in-law. And he would speak about his father-in-law, and this is where, where they went. Crazy. He would speak about his father-in-law as the candidate for Mashiach of our generation. The Rebbe would speak in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s about his father-in-law. And people understood that it was the Rebbe's humility, that he was like the extension yeah. of that. Well, he never right? called himself the Rebbe either. Exactly. So this is where they're coming from. You have to understand that they're not they're not incorrect in 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 declaring the Rebbe as a candidate. I'm going to use the word candidate or the most qualified candidate to be the Mashiach, where they, I think, are crazy is in, is in their um, no, relentless, no. what's the word? Their, their, their methodology of trying to get the Exactly. Message. You know, it's one thing to think what you want to think, but you don't have to say everything that you're thinking. And you don't have to scream it down everybody's throats. You know, they're walking around with huge pins and these crazy yarmulkes that look like helmets, and they're, they're waving flags, and they're, and they're sabotaging other events with their agenda. You know, they're coming with loudspeakers and megaphones. It's, it's, it's distressing, it's disturbing, it's unpleasant. So now, this is how they took over 770. They become zealots. They became zealots, exactly. The so, what? Oh, now, now let, me, let me start. My father just sent me a letter. Uh, sorry, a quick note about, about the Rebbe. Very interesting note. No, I don't think so. Um, my father sent me this, this note this morning. Here, he said like this. He said that there's a shliach in, in Seattle. His name is Rabbi Sholem Ber Levitin. Rabbi Sholem Ber Levitin in 1967 was uh, was testimony to the story himself. He said it was one evening in 1967, they just, the Chabad headquarters had just purchased 788 Eastern Parkway, which is a dormitory near 770. It's the Yeshiva dormitory. And he said, I was standing alone outside of 770. It was a regular night. Suddenly the Rebbe came out of his room, walking towards his house. And before he goes down the steps of 770, we heard... Uh, we could hear the sound of fire trucks coming down Eastern Parkway. And they stopped right outside of 788 Eastern Parkway. The Rebbe, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe stopped and he said aloud, let's go and look what's happening over there. And he walked towards 788. He stopped nearby. I stood near the Rebbe. And I saw after a few seconds that the Rebbe turns his face around towards 770. And he says emotionally, they're breaking my buildings. Who is, who's, where's is the responsible parties? They're breaking my buildings. Who, who, who's responsible for this? Something, there must have been some sort of a problem. Like maybe these yeshiva students were, you know, were redesigning interior modeling or design or something and somebody called the, called the ambulance. So the fire, the fire, the fire engine. So the Rebbe went back to the door of 770 and, and he stood there by himself. Um, without any secretaries nearby him, and he stood there for half an hour until the last of the fire trucks left the, the building. 
Rabbi Chaikin and two other yeshiva students stood by the door. And whatever. That, that was the story my father sent me. In other words, there was, my father was saying to me how sad it is that here they're fighting for the Rebbe, right? We want to be close to the Rebbe. Yet, what they're doing is, is that they're going clearly against the Rebbe. You know, you could, the whole building could crash down. Who knows what kind of, uh, you know, kind of foundations they're chipping away at in order to make their little tunnel. Right? The whole building comes crashing down, God forbid, right? It, it's, it's a travesty. It's, it's passionate zealots that began as well-intentioned. But they went off the deep end. And that's what happened in 770. I can tell you with great confidence that 99.7% of Chabad is opposed to this behavior. But there is, this, the, the, there is the aggressive minority, the very aggressive m minority that makes us Jews all look bad or Chabadniks all look bad. And that's why it was important to have that statement coming out of uh, Rabbi Krinsky's office. Um, I think the story is being entirely sensationalized in light of what's going on in Israel and those tunnels. But at the end of the day, um, just when it comes to the essence of the of the discussion about the Rebbe being Mashiach and these guys are fighting, we're bringing in the redemption, we're fighting for Moses, we're fighting for Maimonides, we're fighting for, for every Jew that lived in the history of the world, we're going to bring the Messiah by these actions. It's crazy. At the end of the day, we believe in the coming of the Mashiach. We don't care who the Mashiach is. It doesn't matter to me if the Mashiach lives in Bnei Brak or if he lives in the North Pole or if he lives in, uh, in, in, in Moscow or somewhere else. Let him come. You're asking me who he is? I would say, I, I can't imagine somebody more qualified than the Rebbe, but you know what? Surprise me. Do you know what I mean? L l it doesn't, but for these guys, it's all about the superficial. It's all about the clip. It's got to be this picture and this place and this building and, and, and you can't stand in my way. There's no other conversation. That's what's going on over here. Have I answered the question? Yeah. I'm, I'm relieved because it's not Bernie Sanders. <laughs> okay, and I gotta go. All right, guys. Great discussion. Thank you. Good. Done. And to answer your question. Yeah, the focus on the individual is always wrong. I think there are basically several things that you said that, that made sense. Is that we gotta view it as a process, messianic times, not as a, a one-shot deal. And that the, the final prophecies of Bayom that we say every day in every Aleinu is is the, is more of an end point kind of stuff, not uh, not a part of the process. And the process, don't worry about who the individual is, just do the right thing. The main thing is let's do the right thing to bring Mashiach. Exactly. Do another act of goodness and kindness. Be kind to a fellow yeah. Jew, especially a Jew that you don't like and that you don't agree with. Don't say Lashon Hara. Right? Don't say Lashon Hara. Don't be, don't say nasty things about about other Jews. Be good. Be kind. Bring the bring more light into the world. Let's bring Mashiach. Jana, are you okay with my answer? With my explanation, you okay with everything over here? Fantastic. Yeah. So would it have made sense for for the Rebbe to have declared a leader to succeed? I think the Rebbe did. No, what you? I really do. I really I got, do. I totally got what you described about the solution. Yeah, but absent a a person who says this is right and this is wrong, you have a schism. So okay, so the Rebbe did make my grandfather the, uh, the the executor of, you know, the chairman of the movement. He didn't make him that, but um, he's not. But, was just but he's not the Rebbe. He's not the Rebbe, so, so he doesn't have. Who selected the Rebbe? He wasn't selected by his father as well. It's interesting. It was, no, the, it was, people. It was the people. It was the people. That's my point. Them. And there was a fight so, over It's interesting, right? So I'm sure that the Rebbe in his own mind said, look, when the time comes, the people, if they yeah. feel they need a, 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 Rebbe. a another Rebbe, they'll, they'll select it's 30 years now. Well, there was yeah. a fight over that also. And then there was a split in the family. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. was a split in the family. Yeah. There was a split in the yeah. location of yeah. the yeah. versus... Right. Uh, anyway, thank you all. I hope this answers your question. Yeah.